onboarding time, it's the most important time in your relationship with that client. It's really like the honeymoon phase and you have to over deliver on what you promised during the sales process. I love bookkeeping. Hi everyone. And thank you for listening to the I Love Bookkeeping podcast. My name is Hannah Robinson. And I'm Melissa Honan. And thank you so much for listening. Today, we're going to be talking about something that's a part of our communication series, and that is managing expectations, especially when it comes to the onboarding process. Um, In our last episode, we talked about kind of the step before this, which is pre-qualifying sales leads. So basically filtering filtering out those who are good for you and those clients who maybe are not so good for you. So today we're taking kind of the next step, which is talking about managing expectations with that new client, particularly during the onboarding process. Um, Melissa, as per, I know you have so many, so much good insight um, on this topic. I love talking about this because I love talking about sales. Um, Like sales is my passion. And I really believe that onboarding is an extension of the sales process and that they're really hand in hand. And so I know I like I always see a lot of people are like, okay, well, now that, you know, they're they're a client and they're, you know, we're onboarding them and moving them into production. And it's just like it has to go to this and that and the other. But what you really kind of need to pull yourself back and realize that just because you've closed the sale doesn't mean that it's really closed at that point. Like the onboarding time, it's the most important time in your relationship with that client. It's really like the honeymoon phase and you have to over deliver on what you promise during the sales process. Like it is literally the most important time in your relationship. And so it really needs to stay like top priority. Like you, yes, you closed, you closed the the sale. Like that's a great, like great, like, you know, you know, item for you, but it's really not fully closed until it's in production, right? Because at any point during the onboarding process, they could change their minds if they see that you are not what they thought you were. Mm. So at what point during the sales process do you think it's best to really communicate your expectations for them? Whew, the entire time. The entire time. Yes. And <clears throat> so this is something that I recently updated our proposal to. In our bookkeeping proposal, it even outlines what the sales into onboarding into production cycle looks like. Like from the moment we start talking, I'm going to tell you what it's like and what your journey in our relationship is going to be um, in the step-by-step. Like for me, you know, it 100% is just communicating and managing their expectations for what the next steps are going to be the entire time. And so even you know, during the first meeting, I always like to talk and tell them about next steps. Like, what does that look like? What questions do they have? Like, just, you know, essentially leaving like little Easter eggs, like throughout the sales process so that they know that this is to come or this is part of the process or asking them, you know, what they need. Um, I, I think that talking about what the next step into onboarding looks like throughout the sales process is extremely important to just kind of keep it front of mind. But also that is essentially assuming the close too, which is kind of like a mind trick. Because if you talk about like, you're assuming that they're coming on board with you. So you're telling them about the onboarding process from the beginning. Like, I know you want to work with me. So this is what it's going to look like. (laughs) Um, And I don't mean to do it like in like a manipulative type of way, but I really just assume that every single person that I talk to wants to work with me and is going to come on board with me and I treat them as such. Share something that's on your level of comfort, but what are some expectations that you communicate? Um, You need to get me the shit that I asked for, but I say that much more professionally. (laughs) Um, But sometimes I don't, um, which is just kind of something that I can do. So again, like, uh, you know, definitely uh, take any recommendations I make with a grain of salt and modify them to your personality type because you might not be able to pull that off. Um, I can. Um, But I do get that. I get that question a lot from people is probably more lately, I don't know what the trend is, but I've had a lot of sales prospects ask me what my red flags are or like what issues I've had with clients in the past that they can like make sure that they're not, you know, that 
person. Um, I don't know if like there's, you know, like a Google like questions to ask my bookkeeper type thing <laughs> that like has been coming up, but I've gotten this probably about half a dozen times in the last couple of months. And I do, I always tell them that you, the biggest issue that I have is if you don't communicate with me. Um, and if you, if you can't communicate whether good or bad, then our relationship's not going to work. And that's even if say you, something did come up because I know that you're a business owner and I know that you're busy and you're wearing all of the hats right now. And we're moving into busy season for contractors. And the thing for me is just, if you can't get me what I need, I just need you to tell me. But that's what, at the end of the day, it really is just communication. If you just keep those open lines of communication, then I'm happy. But if you ghost me, I don't, I don't know what to do. And, and that's not good for either of us. Right. Um, so if you, if, you know, please get me the information that I need. If you can't, please tell me, and then we will figure out an alternate plan. Um, and I always give my clients the option, you know, we can sit down and co-work through this if you need to. Like, this doesn't just have to be on you. Like, I understand people that are inclined to procrastinate. Like, no, you're going to sit in a meeting with me and we'll do it together. Um, but for me, I tell them during the onboarding process, like, I can't have excuses for why they can't get me things. Once you're in production, if you can't get me something, just let me know. But during the onboarding process, that's a hard no. I understand. And I tell them up front, again, managing communications. We are going into your busy season right now. Can you commit to getting me everything that I need during this onboarding process? Can't, because if you can't, then our onboarding is doomed from the start. You will never get put into production and we're going to have ongoing lingering issues. So it's April. I'm not going to have you onboarded until the beginning of June. In June, you have $250,000 of sales booked. Am I going to have your attention? Probably not. So we need to think about how this is going to work. We got to think ahead of time. I can make that work and I can teach other people how to say that in a way that works for them. For me, I'm very direct and to the point that works for me, that doesn't work for everybody. Um, but like I said, I think it, it's all about Easter eggs too, is, is just making those communications clear throughout the process. And if there are certain things you don't know how to say or when to say it, always making sure that it's in your proposal as well. Just have it covered in writing. Yeah. So on the flips, on, on kind of a different subject, but still talking about expectations and communicating your expectations and their expectations, especially during the onboarding process. Um, how, and I think a lot of people who are listening can identify with this struggle. How do you communicate your boundaries when it comes to your personal life and defending your personal life up front? Because I think that's so important. And that's something that I think a lot of us have made the mistake of not doing is not mm -hmm. communicating up front. Like, hey, these are my hours. If you um, if you email me after hours, I will get back to you next business hours. Or I don't work this day. Or, you know, something of that nature. Because I think a lot of people listening, they want that freedom that having a virtual yeah. bookkeeping business gives them. And so how do you communicate your boundaries and your expectations for when you're going to do work for them up front? That's a great question. And that circles back to, I think we covered in the sales process episode about features, benefits, and check questions. I remember going on like, you know, I, a blackout rage talking about features, benefits, and check questions. I love them so much. That's a, that's a feature of working with you, right? You know, for instance, at Bookkeeping for Painters, we have a 24-hour communication policy which means that we'll respond to your request within, you know, 24 hours. Um, that means that, you know, we might not have the full answer for you within 24 hours, but we're going to acknowledge your request and let you know that we're working on getting you an answer. Typically, we should have an answer within two to three business days, um, if not sooner than that, but you'll know that we got your request and we're working on it. Then, of course, you know, like, going through like what the benefits and the check questions are on, on that kind of a thing, but just explaining it as just a matter of fact, because it is right. Like this, these are our hours of operation. This is our typical turnaround time to answer your questions. This is how we answer your questions. And when we answer your questions, like it doesn't have to be like my boundary is I work nine to five and I will not respond to you afterwards. 
It's just letting them know like, hey, because guess what? I can guarantee you whatever your hours of operation are um, or whatever your turnaround time for requests, it's going to be a hell of a lot better than a CPA. Like I have literally have clients that I, more times than not where they're like, yeah, it takes like four to six weeks for them to respond to my email. Like it is lit- it is the worst out there. And I get it. Like I get it from this side of things, right? Like I'm not judging CPAs that do that. Like y'all are busy. Um, but, I mean, but I, I'm judging you a little bit. We can talk about that in another episode. Um, like get a, get an executive assistant or something like just, you know, figure it out, but whatever. Um, I actually don't because that gives me more clients that come to me instead. Uh, so continue with your four to six week email response time. I'm going to respond to clients within 24 hours. Um, and I'm going to tell them that and that's a feature of working with me. And then what I need to do to establish that boundary is to stick by that and not answer their emails at 11 o'clock at night. (laughs) Um, And so that's the big thing is is definitely utilize. If you do work at 11 o'clock at night, good for you. Do not send a client an email at 11 o'clock at night. Utilize email scheduling to send it out at an appropriate hour that is in your business hours so that you do not, you know, subconsciously tell the client that it's okay if they email you at 11 o'clock at night and expect an answer. So um, you, you know, just let them know this is, my hours of operation. This is how long it's going to take me to respond to you on average. Um, You know, you could even tell them, you know, you know, you're welcome to bump up this or do whatever. Um, And then you have to actually only work with them within your hours of operation as well. Today's show is brought to you by Keeper, the one app to run your bookkeeping business. Keeper helps you get faster client responses with your own custom branded QuickBooks integrated client portal. Finally, you can say goodbye to those pesky spreadsheets full of uncategorized transactions. Keeper also helps you catch those embarrassing coding errors before your clients do. And with Keeper, you can generate beautiful custom reports that your clients will absolutely love to read. To find out more, go to keeper.app. That's keeper.app. Mention I Love Bookkeeping to get 20% off your first three months. Again, go to keeper.app to find out more. Thank you for listening. I think the first step of implementing this is to actually dig deep and figure out what your expectations are and what (laughs) their expectations need to be and get crystal clear on what they are. And don't really, I don't want to say, you know, don't be stiff as a board and not help people, but don't bend over backwards at the same time. That's not your job. And so I think, I think the first step of really managing expectations as a whole is to get crystal clear on what they are. Did you do that when you first started your business or did that kind of come later when you realized like, oh, wow, I should have done this? It, I have always done that. Other people on my team have not. Um, Daniel has like, he, I don't think he has boundaries. Um, <laughs> just like with, the way that he responds to clients, he will respond to clients at nine o'clock at night. He disregards all advice that I give on that. Um, for him, he will always bend over backwards to help clients. That's the way that he feels like it should be. And I don't disagree with that, but I do feel like you should set expectations so that anything you do outside of that is seen by the client as bending over backwards and not, you know, an expectation that they have like, oh, okay, well, if I email them at nine o'clock at night, like they better respond to me. No, it's like, okay, I know that they're going to get back to me within 24 hours. Oh, wow. Daniel just got back to me within five seconds. Fantastic. Like, (laughs) um, I just think that, you know, I always try to go above and beyond for my clients, but I want them to understand that that is not normal, I guess. Um, That is not the standard. Um, And that way, if I get busy and I don't respond to them for 24 hours. They're not disappointed that we didn't respond to them within the hour this time, you know? Like, so I think it's it's definitely a fine balance. Um, just like the, the client example I gave last time, which was, you know, we did end up getting this guy his books within like technically three business hours. Um, that is not the norm. Uh, it would have been perfectly in our realm to just say no, but um, we try not to say no and we try to go above and beyond to that our clients can see that we care about them. And because we do understand at the end of the day, like they hire us because they don't know what they're doing. Right. And so in any instance where we can just take, you know, 
extra time to make sure it gets done, um, then we're going to do that. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think for those of you who are listening, who maybe didn't make managing expectations a big part of your onboarding process, I hope that this inspires you to get really crystal clear on your expectations and um, communicate them. I think, I mean, we talk about this whole series is about communication and um, communication is really everything. Um, When it comes to, I guess, maintaining that client relationship, um, how do you kind of manage the expectations when it comes to more, less of an onboarding and more of a maintaining? Yeah, I think that's definitely... Loaded question. (laughs) Yeah. But I do think, again, it's, it's... People can't meet your expectations if they don't know what they are. So I, I, again, it does come back around to communicating it um, frequently, <laughs> often, uh, reminding them throughout the entire process because they're, they're, you know, think about all the stuff that you have to go over in a sales process and then all of the stuff you have to go back over into an onboarding process. Um, so if you want something to really stick, you need to, to, to remind them frequently. So I think it's really important that when they've completed their onboarding and they're moving into production, you have another conversation about what that needs to look like. Um, and just at, and then every time you're doing this, it's not coming from a place of like, if you don't do this, I will fire you. It's, hey, you know, just want to let you know, like, let's go back over what this is going to look like for you. Um, it's just out of the kindness of your heart that you are letting them know ahead of time what the next steps is so that they feel comfortable with that. Um, I think it's really important for me as somebody with anxiety <laughs> to be overly clear about what to expect in the future um, because I am just anxious by nature. So I now operate under the assumption that everybody else does that as well. Um, and that has made me better in sales. Um, it's just assuming that everyone is always anxious about what's going to come next. So I try to prepare them as best I can for what that's going to look like. Um, again, I think having documents in place to help you with this. Um, so, you know, for instance, you know, in the sales process, you have your proposal, which lays out the expectations in onboarding. Um, our self onboarding process does have information about what next steps look like. Um, you know, having a sheet, like an in production sheet that goes over again with your clients, what the next steps are like written from the onboarding into the in production process with dates and expectations for when reports are available. Like, you know, this doesn't just have to be in person conversations. I think it's very important that a lot of it is in person so that you can answer their questions, but having, you know, Using automation and, you know, worksheets and tools to your advantage to make sure that the message gets across is a great way as well to reinforce, like, it is written. It has been explained to you in person. You got it in an email. You got it in a worksheet. It was on your proposal. It's in our contract. Um, You know, if you don't meet with every client, depending on how you onboard, some people don't do in-person onboardings. If you record a quick loom video of you going over expectations so they see your face and your mouth moving as you explain your expectations, whatever it is, try to hit them from every different angle so that they they know, so that it's been made clear. Um, the really important things that you want to stick with them. Mm, I like that. And I like, I like hearing about how you keep your expectations really crystal clear throughout the process. Because I think, I, I think when it comes to nurturing kind of any relationship, um, you evolve and you, you kind of have new expectations. And I think when you realize that, like, okay, this isn't working for me. I have a new expectation now. And I really like how Mm -hmm. you immediately communicate that with your clients, because I think a lot of the times we, we get expectations and adopt them with the new relationships that we're taking on Mm -hmm. instead of, nurturing what we have, I think it's equally as important. Well, first of all, any current client needs to take precedent over new clients. Like if you go into that line of thought, you will be successful. Um, I cannot stand people that respond to prospects faster than they respond to current clients. Mine is the opposite. I have more availability on my calendar available for current clients than I do for free consultations. And that's the way it should always be. You should always continue to nurture your the current relationship that you have. And this is a side rant that the best way for you to make more money is not to close new sales. It is to close your current clients on 
new services, additional services, add-on services, upgraded services, and help nurture them so that they grow their revenue so that they can have a price increase based on their revenue. Um, And we can talk about that another day. But I would like to say that a lot of this has grown (laughs) from a place of... um, me messing up enough times that uh, I have gotten to this point where um, I do manage expectations throughout the process. There has been so many times because of the way that, you know, I am, you know, I did not over communicate a lot of these expectations. And I was finding a lot of clients that were coming back and saying, well, you didn't say this, you didn't say that. Okay, well, I recorded that meeting and I did. Um, (laughs) but actually, (laughs) uh, I have every piece of documentation we have ever communicated. I, I coming from a sales background. Okay. I take notes for everything, every phone call, every text message, every email, every smoke signal I have sent to you is documented with the date and the time that that occurred. Okay. So, you know, I can list up that I sent you 15 emails, 14 phone calls, 13 voice messages, and that 14, you know, the 15th voicemail um, didn't go through because your mailbox is full, clear out your mailbox. Like whatever it is, I have that written down, okay? And so the thing is, is that I always had myself covered on that side, but it was, it still wasn't getting through to them. Um, And so I reevaluated because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I've said it, if they're not hearing it. And it's not being retained. And so that's where, again, I went back into revamping our sales process from an educational point of mind. Less of a, it needs to be said um, and it needs to be covered. And into how can I get my clients to retain this very important information? Um, from like a legal perspective, from a sales process, I need to say it, they need to hear it, whatever. No, I want them to really listen to it, hear it, retain it, and know what this is going to be like moving forward. And I had to modify my behavior and my process for that to happen. It's not on them. At the end of the day, you you will not change that client. Like, <laughs> it's the same thing, right? When you get, like, we were talking about, you know, client relationships are like, you know, romantic relationships. Like, you're not changing that man and you are not changing that client, okay? A client will only change if they want to change. Um, <laughs> the same thing with that boyfriend, okay? Um, so if anything you know, you, you need to modify how you approach that relationship if you want that relationship to last. Um, and that's what I, I did. I revamped my sales process. And so far, it has been ex- much more successful with the clients retaining the information and the expectations. And we have had m- much better success, I think, with identifying and retaining our ideal clients. And we have transitioned several clients out sooner during the onboarding process than we ever had before. Clients either on their own accord or us deciding, hey, we actually decided this wasn't a good fit right now in the onboarding process. We're going to end this early and we're going to refund you your money just by managing expectations. And that's, and at the end of the day, yeah, okay, that's a loss. Lost a $600 a month client. Lost an $800 a month client. Lost a $2,000 a month client. Would have lost a hell of a lot more if we waited a year to do that. Well, I have loved hearing your insight on this because I know you have so much to share. And I really know that our listeners appreciate your insight and your knowledge that you have about this subject. Um, If you have questions, comments, concerns, or just want to say, hey, please shoot us an email at success at ilovebookkeeping.com. Again, that is success at ilovebookkeeping.com. My name is Hannah Robinson. And I'm Melissa Honan. And thank you for listening to the I Love Bookkeeping podcast. I love bookkeeping. Ah! Here's a little shout to all my friends working hard at keeping the books. You want to change your life? You want to grow that business? Not-